Good morning from London. On this Remembrance Sunday, thousands of veterans and their families come to the heart of this city to pay tribute to those who have died in war. The setting, the iconic buildings, Westminster Abbey on the left, the Houses of Parliament on the right, and beyond the Elizabeth Tower, which people call Big Ben, the tower in which Big Ben hangs. It's familiar sound used to mark the hours, but for the past few months it's been silent as repairs have been made to the tower. But this weekend it's been briefly reprieved to ring out 11 o'clock and the start of the two minutes silence. The ceremony this morning takes place around the cenotaph in the middle of Whitehall. And since 8 o'clock, people have been passing through the security barriers to find a place to watch the ceremony. They come from all over the United Kingdom and abroad, some, many, in the front row for the first time. They stand 10 deep here. Some of them bring young children. Some are here because their parents or their grandparents are too old to come anymore, but they want the day to be remembered. And at the heart of the ceremony, the cenotaph built in 1920 to commemorate the dead in the First World War of 1914 to 1918. This November, a hundred years ago, one of the harshest battles, the Battle of Passchendaele, ended. Mud, mud everywhere, filthy, oozing mud one soldier wrote, and the chief of staff later said, did we really send men to fight in that? In three months, half a million men of the Allied and German armies lost their lives. The First World War was a war so brutal that it was hoped it would end the use of war as a political weapon. But the truth, of course, was otherwise. From the Second World War, 1939 to 1945, there's barely been a year without more deaths to commemorate, more seriously wounded to restore to some kind of life, and more families to console. And so here in London and in churches and at war memorials across the country and abroad, there is much to reflect on this November weekend. Beyond the cenotaph on Whitehall, several thousand ex-servicemen and women have been gathering on Horse Guards Parade, ready for the great march past and the laying of wreaths. Many of them come year after year to remember lost comrades. Of course, the war they fought in is different from the wars fought now. The techniques of warfare have changed but the courage needed to carry out some of the most dangerous missions does not. Two men who served generations apart in very different wars are united by their similar experience of battle. My name is George Fogo. I joined the army in 1942 and I was a member of the bomb disposal. In 1940-41, the life expectancy of bomb disposal was somewhere about a month to six weeks. My name is Tom Flanagan. I worked as a bomb disposal officer in Afghanistan. My experiences were very ordinary if I were to compare it to other servicemen or women deployed in Afghanistan, but certainly very extraordinary uh, in my life. It was great to meet a man from the same area in, in warfare, entirely different, but yet it's the same. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the only thing that separates it is 70 odd years. The first call out, if you like, that you had, can you remember that? Yes, uh, yes. Oh, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And anybody who says that they went to dig out a bomb or into a minefield and see they weren't afraid, I'm sure, they're damned liars. 
after the task complete, then there's a feeling of euphoria, I guess. You know, you've completed, especially your first task, you've got that done, that's, uh, I can do this. It's, uh, the training's all been leading up to this and uh, it's gone well. And what was your role in France? It was six weeks solid lifting mines. Wow. And that was the worst six weeks of my army life. The lifting mines was more exhausting than, than the bombs because your concentration was so, so high there. So the mines were laid in a pattern? They were always laid in a pattern, yes. Yeah. But the Germans put in a rogues here and there okay. to, to try and catch out. out. But these were buried beneath the surface? Yes, oh, aye, aye. And how did you find the, those mines? How did you...? Just with the mine detector. OK. We used to only use the, the detector about 20 minutes because uh, you, 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 you were that tense that you began okay. to get mixed up. Mm -hmm. We were there out in, in, in the field all day long and you were under tension the whole time. IEDs would be discovered in a number of ways, whether you were doing a planned op and you used your search team with your searchers out the front using their metal detectors, if you like. A lot of the devices were very basic. Very. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we didn't lose anybody in the mines in our platoon, but another platoon lost five in, in one go. There were five men just blown to bits. And did you lose any men then when no, you were there? I was very lucky in that my team were all okay. Um, we had uh, a few friends who were injured uh, permanently, um, and uh, I remember that affecting me a little bit at the time. Yeah, but you just do. have to get on with uh, it. I enjoyed my tour. Um, I found it very rewarding. I felt like I was making a difference. But you have to remember that there's lots of people who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Over a decade ago, a new memorial was unveiled here on Whitehall, the Bronze Memorial to Women of World War II. And the role of women in society, of course, has changed dramatically since the First World War. Then, women undertook all kinds of work as long as it wasn't fighting. By the time of the Second World War, their role was changing. And now, today, they serve alongside men, equal in the front line, at sea, on land, in the air, doing the fighting. Sophie Rayworth has with her some serving women of today. Sophie. Well, serving members of the armed forces cannot take part in the march pass today, but I am joined by three women who are all here. They've come to watch and they've also come here to mark that centenary. Um, I'm joined here by a leading hand, Tina Keel, uh, Corporal Cassie Collins and Sergeant Rita Rana. And Cassie Collins, you, your family, the women in your family very much embody how women's roles have changed over the past 100 years. Yeah, so I've got a total of over 100 years of family service history. My grandma served in the Catering Corps in the Army. My mother was a Royal Air Force supplier, and I am now in the Royal Air Force as a personal support clerk. And you're about to be sent next year to Afghanistan? Yes, I'm going early, um, early next year to Afghanistan, and I'll be leaving behind my two-year-old little girl. And Tina, you have really seen how, how it has all changed because you joined as a Wren in the 1990s, didn't you? Yes, I joined as a Wren. Um, uh, there wasn't too many opportunities to go anywhere near the front line or um, to follow the aircraft that I wanted to work on at the time. But since then, we've had all of the front line jobs open to us. We can now go to sea and there's nothing really that we can't do in the Royal Navy now. And do you nowadays feel that you very much, when you serve, you stand shoulder to shoulder to the men, or is there, is there still a difference? No, there's no difference. I very much feel like I, I do stand shoulder to shoulder with the, the men that I work with, yes. And Rita Rana, you followed in your father's footsteps, didn't you? You are serving now, you joined more recently, but your father was a Gurkha. 
Yeah, absolutely, that's right. Um, so I joined in 2009. Um, my father did 27 years of service um, in the uh, Gorkha Rifles, and prior to that, my grandfather was actually, um, ser he served as well, so he went to Malay War and Borneo War. My father then did, um, went to uh, Falklands in 1982. Um, so. And as a woman joining the forces, do you as well, do you feel that you are, you are shoulder to shoulder with, with the men? You can do what the men do now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, on a daily basis, we do what they do. So, you know, we're still doing the physical side, um, same as what the guys do. I mean, um, so, yeah, I do feel like that we are um, standing shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you think 100 years ago, before, in 1917, before 1917, women, they could be nurses. That was it. And then everything changed in 1917. And nowadays, it's the close combat roles that are now being opened up. Yeah, so we've been, we're really fortunate in the Royal Air Force. We're the first service to open up the close combat roles um, in the Royal Air Force Regiment. Um, I don't think that it should be forgotten, though, that women have been serving in close combat roles, supporting the infantry and regiments for a number of years now, whether that is medics, um, pilots, loadmasters. There's a multiple, there's a multiple, um, there's a multitude of roles which women have been doing for years now. How, how important is it for you to be here today on this centenary? Oh, very important. It's a time for, for reflection. I think about my ancestors that have served before me, um, people in more re recent years going to conflicts. Definitely a time to think about these people. And when you joined the Royal Navy, I mean, you, women, as, as a woman, you could not even go to the front line, could you? No. So um, I, I worked on a squadron, but I couldn't go front line on that squadron. So there wasn't anywhere for me to go, really, apart from a training area, which um, is not, didn't seem fair at the time. but. It's the way it was. It really has changed. And what does it mean to both of you to be here today? Um, I think it's a good opportunity to give thanks to um, all of our colleagues that we serve alongside now and all of the millions of people that we'll never get to meet that served for us. And Rita, your father is here, isn't he? He's been before, you haven't. Oh yeah, no, this is my first time here, but no, my father comes here with his, uh, with his old friends every year to, um, for the Remembrance Parade, and uh, I, you know, it's a special, special occasion for me today as well, you know, remembering my grandfather, like I said, he's no longer with us, um, and all the, um, all, all the fallen um, heroes. So, yeah, no, it's special. Well, thank you all of you for talking to us, and uh, a very special day, I know, for all of you. Thank you. What a, re what a remarkable change. A hundred years since the first women served in the armed forces. Uh, there is one other change we should mention in the ceremonial here today. Her Majesty the Queen, who's laid a wreath on behalf of the nation almost every year since she came to the throne in 1952, will this year no longer fulfill that duty. She's going to be watching from a balcony and Prince Charles will lay a wreath on her behalf. Buckingham Palace says this is because she wants to be beside the Duke of Edinburgh who has given up his official duties. She'll be looking down on the veterans waiting to march past later and on the hollow square, the formal part of the parade that surrounds the cenotaph. The Royal Navy, 177 members, the Royal Naval contingent from Portsmouth and Devonport, and the Clyde from Forty Commando, from the Royal Fleet Artillery, the Household Cavalry, the Lifeguards mounting it today, 25 of them under the command of Captain Vaughan, and the King's Troop of the Royal Horse Artillery to their left, who fire the salute at the start and end of the two-minute silence. And then the Royal Air Force, among them 22 women from different stations and the Queen's colour squadron of the Royal Air Force. And then also here the engineers, the reserve forces, 101 Engineer Regiment, And with the 1st Engineer Regiment, you may be able to see later on Colonel Dyshevska, who's commanding it, and the civilian services, the police, the fire services, Red Cross, many of them who were involved in the Grenfell Tower disaster and 
on other major uh, events are here too on this hollow square. This morning of remembrance will begin with the mass bands of the household division and what is called the traditional music. Today under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Roberts, the senior director of music, who's appearing here for the last time, will go to Nether Hall where the musicians for the military are trained when he finishes this. And his Music takes the form it always does. He starts with the stirring sound of Rule Britannia. March of the Royal Navy, Heart of Oak. Minstrel boy. The minstrel boy to the war is gone, in the ranks of death you'll find him. Now, the Welsh anthem, Men of Harlech.
Senior Drum Major Scott Fitzgerald of the Coldstream Guards. Now stands the mass bands at Eads, and the music is taken up by the pipes and drums of the Highlanders, 4th Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, and the Sky Boat Song. Mass bands now play Isle of Beauty, David of the White Rock, and Oft in the Stilly Night. Everyone who's come to march past the Senate after today has a story to tell. Thousands of stories of physical and mental pain, of stress, and of the misery of loss. Let's just hear three of those stories. I was shot by a uh, sniper rifle. A large bullet had gone through my neck and it had taken most of my spinal cord. I had a bang, and that's when the other guy who was with me said, Mark, I think you've been shot. I said, you know, with the extent of my injuries, they've come to the conclusion that I'm not going to be able to walk again. My whole world had just ended, really. I think if someone came in and says, right, I would have asked them to finish, them, finish the job off, really. I've done some extremely hard courses in my, in my career, but that was probably the hardest thing I've done, my, my rehabilitation. I, I ended up walking out on a walking stick. I was um, assessed to have severe post-traumatic stress disorder caused by my time in the Falklands. I was having night terrors. I became very combative, argumentative with my children and my wife. My wife was coming to the end of her tether um, and she said that I, I had to go for help and she actually came with me to the doctor's surgery. I started to talk but I just broke down. I went on the six-week course recommended to me by my psychologist. I met people who were going through exactly the same thing as I was. Since having treatment, I've been able to cope a lot better Charlie Henry Wood was my husband, and he was killed in Afghanistan on the 28th of December 2010. He told me that he loved me, but if anything happened, he'd want me to continue my life. I told him to go out there, stay safe, and don't try and be a hero, that he just needed to make sure that he came home in one piece and to bring all his soldiers with him. I still think to this day that he knew that he was never going to come home. Obviously, the normal situation would be that they would come to the house to tell me. But obviously, they couldn't track me down because it was Christmas, I was away from home. A gentleman came on the phone and he asked if I was Mrs. Heather Wood. And I knew straight away. And suddenly, within a split second, my whole life had gone. I'd lost everything. Mm -hmm. The day that Charlie died, there was 9,000 troops in Afghanistan at that time, and Charlie was the one that got killed.
The pipes and drums who are playing now have a reputation for showing quite extraordinary courage in battle, leading the troops over the top of the trenches. 500 pipers were killed in World War I. They play now the lament, the flowers of the forest. Now the haunting notes of the most reflective of Edward Elgar's enigma variations, Nimrod.
Dido's Lament by Henry Purcell. When I am laid in earth, remember me, but ah, uh, forget my fate. And it plays as we wait for the procession of clergy and the choir who'll be leading the service of remembrance to come out onto Whitehall. Crossbearer Edward Fanshaw leads the children and gentlemen of the Chapel Royal, the sergeant of the vestry, the forces chaplain, the subdean of the Chapel Royal, and the former Bishop of London, still Dean of Her Majesty's Chapels Royal, Dr. Richard Charters, will be conducting the service. They'll be followed by the Major General commanding the Household Divisions procession, traditionally the personal guard of the Sovereign. Dr. Dr. Charter is there, no longer Bishop of London, but he still holds this post as Dean of the Chapels Royal. Well, the Major General's procession, for unknown reasons, has not come out onto Whitehall. They may have changed the arrangements a bit because here, led by Theresa May, the Prime Minister, and Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, come the politicians. SNP on the left there, former Prime Minister behind, Sir John Major, Tony Blair. And here is the Major General's procession. Led by the Chief of the Defence Staff, Sir Stuart Peach, the First Sea Lord, the Chief of the General Staff, the Chief of the Air Staff. And the long line of high commissioners, 45 high commissioners, what you might call the ambassadors for Commonwealth countries, the high commissioners and deputy high commissioners. And they're joined by the new Irish ambassador, 
laying the green wreath. As they line up, we're waiting for the 15 different religious denominations who come here to take part in this service. The Roman Catholic Church, the United Hebrew Congregations, the Free Churches, the Buddhist faith, the Methodists, the Islamic, advisor and the Imam of the Armed Forces, the moderator of the United Reformed Church, the Hindu chaplain to the Armed Forces, the president of the Baptist Union, the network of Sikh organizations, Unitarian, Free Christian Churches, Reform Judaism, the Salvation Army, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Church of Scotland, all represented here. And behind, you just saw the Major General's parade the Household Division coming on parade to take their place. And for the first time, the two speakers on, in the center there, John Burko, Speaker of the House of Commons, and Lord Fowler on his right, the Speaker of the House of Lords, will be laying wreaths. So we're now waiting for the members of the royal family after the guard has been called to attention to come on parade. The Prince of Wales leads out seven members of the royal family. He will be laying a wreath that is normally laid by Her Majesty the Queen on behalf of the nation, the Duke of Cambridge, Prince Henry of Wales, the Duke of York, the Earl of Wessex, the Princess Royal and the Duke of Kent are there and their equerries. And on the balcony, the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen watching as we approach 11 o'clock and the two minute silence.
Prince of Wales first lays a wreath on behalf of the Queen. And he will later lay one on his own behalf. The Queen watching from the balcony with the Duke of Edinburgh beside her. And now, on behalf of the Duke of Edinburgh, the equerry lays his wreath. And now the Prince of Wales lays his own wreath. Prince of Wales, who's Colonel-in-Chief of a host of regiments who commanded in the Royal Navy and was a helicopter pilot, as with many members of the royal family has seen a career in the services. He's followed by the Duke of Cambridge. And the Duke of Cambridge comes with Prince Henry of Wales, his brother, and the Duke of York. All three of them have served. Duke of Cambridge, seven and a half years of military service. Prince Henry of Wales, 10 years, including two tours of Afghanistan. And the Duke of York in the Royal Navy and seeking helicopters in the Falklands. Watch from the balcony by Princess Alexandra and the Duchess of Cambridge in the middle and the Countess of Wessex. The Princess Royal, the Duke of Kent, the Earl of Wessex lay their wreaths. Princess Royal is Admiral and Chief Commandant for Women in the Royal Navy. politician's turn, now led by the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Position, Jeremy Corbyn. Ian Blackford. Of the Scottish National Party, their leader in the House of Commons, on behalf also of Plaid Cymru, the Welsh National Party. He's followed by Vince Cable the new leader of the Liberal Democrats. of the Democratic Unionist Party in the House of Commons from Northern Ireland.
now in. In addition to the ceremony, the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burke. of the House of Lords, Lord Fowler. After him, the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, who lays flowers on behalf of the overseas territories, places like Bermuda and the Cayman Islands and Falklands and Gibraltar and St. Helena. the first of the High Commissioners led this time. They normally come at the end, but they are the oldest members of the Commonwealth, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India, all of whom had thousands and thousands of people serving both in the First and the Second World War. Indeed, India, whose acting commissioner is here, is said to have nearly two and a half million people by August 1945 under arms. followed by the High Commissioners or Deputy High Commissioners of Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ghana, Malaysia, Nigeria, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Uganda. Malawi, Malta, George Cross, Zambia, Singapore, Guyana, Botswana, and Lesotho. Barbados, Mauritius, Swaziland, Tonga, Fiji, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, Grenada, Papua New Guinea, and the Seychelles. the final group of High Commissioners from the Commonwealth of Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei Dar es Salaam, Namibia, Cameroon, Mozambique, and Rwanda. The last two recent members of the Commonwealth who were not actually involved in the fighting of the First and Second World Wars, but are here 
because they are members of the Commonwealth and have an entitlement to lay their wreaths. And they're followed by the ambassador of Ireland to Great Britain, Adrian O'Neill. Irish regiments who served from way back. Irish guards established under Queen Victoria and fought in both world wars. The service chiefs come next. The chief of the defense staff, uh, Sir Stuart Peach, doesn't himself lay a wreath, but for the Royal Navy, Sir Philip Jones, for the Army, General Sir Nicholas Carter, and for the Royal Air Force, Sir Stephen Hillier. And they're followed by the civilian chiefs for the Merchant Navy and Fishing Fleets, Captain Martin Reed, for the Air Transport Auxiliary Association, Adrian Led, for the civilian services, Sarah Thornton, who chairs the National Police Chiefs Council. And the wreaths laid around the cenotaph, the service led by Dr. Charters begins. O Almighty God, grant we beseech thee that we who here do honor to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the crown may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, 
save that of knowing that we do thy will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, And to God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen. Queen bows and leaves the balcony and the members of the royal family leave Whitehall, led by Prince Charles, who laid that wreath on behalf of the Queen. Now the clergy will leave next. They line up led by Dr. Charters, Dean of the Chapel Royal, and the children of the Chapel Royal in their scarlet and gold state coats designed at the time of the restoration Charles the second a choir that used to follow the sovereign round the country in Tudor times singing and now sings here in London every week in the Chapel Royal or the Queen's Chapel that was built by James the first six gentlemen in ordinary and ten children of the Royal Chapel. And then the politicians, those serving today and behind them, 
the second group, former prime ministers. John Major is here, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron. The new Secretary of State for Defense, Gavin Williamson there, who'll go out onto horse guards to take the salute of those who go past the cenotaph. And then other members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords and the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, at the end. And so we're waiting now, and there's quite a long pause before we come to the start of the march past. Uh, but we'll be talking to people here, why they've come here, what they remember. So let's uh, first of all join Sophie Rayworth. Well, there are people of all ages taking part in the march past today, but I'm here with the oldest veteran who is taking part. He is 99 years old. He is called Ernie Searling. He is a former Royal Marine. And it is his very first time here. It's your first time here, Ernie, isn't it? What does it mean to you to be here? I feel very humble seeing so many hundreds of men and women on parade today. So very, very humble, and I'm thinking of those that are not with us on this parade today and some of the prime, prime people I served with and we've lost them but all I hope is that the future generations can see this parade, see some solidarity in it and see that the betterment of mankind in England especially Great Britain, should be at its highest level. We don't want street fights, we don't want arguments, we don't want racial just injustice. All those things are horrible. And it is, as you say, very humbling, isn't it, to be standing, to be here today in Whitehall. Why has it taken you so long? Tell us why, because you wanted well, to come. Hasn't exactly, but you see, uh, after the war, I've, I, I seem to have contracted various diseases and illnesses. And every year, I sort of said, well, I'll go, to the, go up to Whitehall, and then something's cropped up. And this year, a uh, Marine came to see me, Ollie came to see me, and he said to me, what about going on that parade, Ernie? And I said, well, it probably will be my last one. I said, but I said, I've been on parades before, big ones. Uh, but I said, I've never been on the Senator one. And I feel very honoured to be here and to be able to talk to you about good things of life. Ernie, I, it's wonderful that you are here. It is absolutely fantastic to see you here your first time. It's an honour to talk to you as well here at the Cenotaph. And I'm just going to talk to the man as well who brought you here. He's right behind us, former Royal Marine as well, Kerry, Kerry Howler. I mean, a wonderful moment for you. It is indeed, yes. It's taken a lot of planning, obviously. And obviously, with the help of the family, we've managed to get it here today. And um, since I heard he's not been down here, I said, yeah. It's got, you've got to do it at some stage. Well, it's going to be a very emotional moment for you shortly. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful description of what the Second World War was fought for in his mind and his hopes for the future. As the President of the Royal British Legion, Air Marshal David Walker, lays the Senate, the uh, at the Cenotaph, his wreath on behalf of the Royal British Legion and then other members of the Royal British Legion who organised this march past will follow. A rather formal exchange of bowler hats. And they're followed by the Royal British Legion Women's Section, Patricia Trimes is the chairman. The Royal British Legion Scotland, Charlie Brown, the national chairman. The Ex-Services League, G 
Chief of the Defence Staff, former Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, General David Richards, the Royal Naval Association, Carol Gibbon. A hundred years since the Wrens were first formed. Brian Patterson of the Royal Air Forces Association, Gary Best for Transport for London. So the first half of today's act of remembrance, the, the more formal part, is over now. And in a few minutes, the second, in many ways to some people, perhaps the most moving part begins with the march past of veterans and sometimes of their families too. What actually brings people here to the Cenotaph? It's always worth hearing. Four of those taking part. Explain. I was a, a pilot in the fleet air arm, flying aircraft off of aircraft carriers. We were flying strikes over mainland Japan. We came in over the edge and were strafing any aircraft we could see. I could see Wally, because we were only about 50 yards apart. Uh, his aircraft started to, 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 to drop. The aircraft slowly went into the ground. It was quite hard to take, really. I was deployed to Afghanistan. The morning of July the 8th, 2010, uh, we set out on our patrol. The sun was just about coming up, and uh, that, was, uh, that was the last sunrise I'd ever see. Um, our, our team got contacted by an IED. I lost my left eye straight away. I had other serious head injuries. By the time I got back to the UK, uh, I was informed that my right eye would have to be removed as well. In 1943, I joined the first aid nursing homery. I was told, you're going to be a wireless operator. We worked to what I now know was people in Europe. But of course, at the time, we didn't know that. Certainly by that time, we knew we were working for SOE. They were stirring up trouble behind the lines in Europe. Years later, when everything was exposed, one learns that the people that we were talking to, as it were, were the group of Norwegians who were on the heavy water plant, which we blew up very successfully and was in fact one of the biggest, I think, successes of the SOE region. I wanted to do something useful, so I volunteered for Korea. I was on the Hill 217. We were vastly outnumbered. We were losing men, and we made up our minds we were going to stay there, and that's all we did because you just can't fight for a hill and then lose it because you've got to go back and retake it again. And that's when you lose the men. We managed to really stabilize uh, our part of uh, Korea. And we're very proud of that. We remember the guy who fought with, the guy that volunteered, the guy that were men that said, the national servicemen, they gave their lives and uh, we all fought side by side. I went back to Japan five years ago. I made a point of going to the cemetery where Wally's remains are and laid a wreath to his stone. When I read the engraving on it at his age, 22, it really brought home to me the opening lines 
of the exaltation. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. A lot of us went out to Europe and were the wireless operators. And indeed, 13 of them were killed. It's certainly them that I think of when I go past the Senatov. And then I think about the modern wars, which are horrendous too. People from my regiment came down to see me. They informed me that uh, Sam Robinson uh, had been killed in the incident. That hit me a lot worse than, um, than the news of losing my sight. It's important to me that I still go and show my respect for, for what people have sacrificed, you know. I've lost my sight, but what we're going to, to show there, what we're, the point of being there is to show respect for the people who have given everything. Well, there are a lot of people who come here year after year to, to pay their respects to honour the war dead. And a lot of familiar faces as well, including this lady who's always here with the white anchor, the words, lest we forget. And this is Vivian Foster, who's the national president of the Merchant Navy Association. As an association you helped form back in 1987. Explain why. Well, basically, I formed the association with colleagues who are now passed, obviously because the Merchant Navy were forgotten. But personally, my family had so much to do with the Merchant Navy in the last war. My father, he was bombed on an oil tanker and got the Lloyds Medal and the MBE for surviving with 13 other personnel and carrying them onto safety. Another uncle, Uncle Stanley, he was killed, torpedoed, second trip across the Atlantic in a convoy. And of course, my uncle Colin, who was the great hero. His story was one of the greatest survival stories of World War II. His ship was torpedoed off the West African coast. The lifeboats were rammed by the submarine and he and 14 managed to climb onto a raft and survived 14 days. Unfortunately, only two survived the 14 days. And basically, a shark followed them for the 50 days, being fed. It was just a horrendous. We can't imagine it. And so many people lost their lives, tens of thousands, more than 30,000 in World War II, more than 10,000 in World War I. And this year for you, is that you're marking a centenary, aren't you? We are indeed, because this year is the start of the convoy system, which really was the saving grace for England. Because in the First World War, had the convoy system not been introduced 100 years ago, just before the end of the war, England had six weeks of food left. And if they didn't get supplies, then in fact we would have had to surrender and Germany would have won. And the convoys in both World War I and World War II, they were absolutely vital. Huge convoys that crossed the Atlantic, weren't they? Well, yes, we had 32,000 men died in the convoys crossing the Atlantic in World War II. And of course, it was just horrendous without their supplying all the, all the forces, in fact, all the forces were supplied. We'd have had no RAF if it wasn't for the Merchant Navy, apart from the fact that England too would have starved. I don't think many people remember rationing, but that was the reason. You've been here so many times, year after year. What is it like though? What does it mean to you to be here? Well, every year I'm so proud to be representing what I represent, but when, as you interviewed Eddie, humbling beyond belief it really really is and who do you think of when you pass the senator my father my father god bless him because of course the red ensign is on the cenotaph and it is the only civilian flag on the cenotaph and it was there many years before the raf's flag on the cenotaph and yet the merchant navy have not had the recognition that they deserve for many many years Vivian Foster, thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure, sir. Thank you very much indeed. There are 262 contingents marching today, nearly 9,000 people marching. And they come here not as part of a service operation, not marshaled by their regiments, but because they've joined together in groups representing either one part of the services or another, or friends who are together, or people who fought together in one place. 
so that it has a kind of haphazard feel to it. The honor of leading off the parade, for instance, this year is led by the Burma Star Association from all parts of the army who served in Burma, their so-called forgotten army. The war against the Japanese, which led to the battles of Kohima and Imphal, which actually stopped the Japanese. They're leading off. They take pride of place today. So the order is given now for the march past. The band leads off. And the music changes to more popular tunes. You'll recognize some of them, no doubt. It's a long way to Tipperary and other famous martial songs will be played to keep them cheerful as they march. In all, something like a mile and a half, which for many of them is a long, long way. The complete circuit of Whitehall from Horse Guards right up to the top of Whitehall and then down past the Cenotaph. And each contingent will lay a wreath or hand a, a wreath to the assistance of the Cenotaph. They will take them and place them on the steps alongside those laid by the members of the royal family, the Queen and the politicians and the High Commissioners until there is a complete garden of poppies around the cenotaph. The London Scottish Regimental Association is there, commemorating the actions of the 2nd Battalion in the Palestinian campaign a hundred years ago. They were preceded by the Monte Cassino Society. And the Gurkha Brigade Association here, led by General Sir David Bill. 95-year-old Captain Smiley is marking marching with them. They've served under the British Crown since 1815. Famous, of course, for their courage in warfare. They've won 26 Victoria Crosses. Take their 18-inch cookery into battle. And as is the way of things with 262 contingents marching, we can't identify each one because we'd never stop talking. But the Aden Veterans Association comes past now. We fought in Aden, the former British colony, now part of Yemen. And the Aden Veterans celebrating the 50th anniversary of the emergency in Aden. They're followed by the Special Forces Club. And Van Gryson is among them. I don't know whether we'll be able to see her, who worked with SOE, who we were hearing earlier on this morning talking about why she was marching and her experiences in the SOE Special Forces Club and the Special Operations Executive. And Van Gryson there on the right of your screen pushed in a wheelchair in the middle of those that group. And the eyes right as she passes the cenotaph. People of extraordinary courage. Help for Heroes, which is a new charity, well, 10 years old, it's not new any longer, which is celebrating its 10th birthday, is on parade here. It was launched particularly to help those who were badly injured. It's already helped 17,000 sick and wounded veterans. More recent conflicts, funding rehabilitation. The Association of Czechoslovak Legionnaires, majority of members joined the resistance movement against Nazism, fought in Czechoslovak military units abroad, which were also formed in the Middle East 
and in Great Britain. Hospital Chelsea, Bill Speakman, VC, who was talking earlier, one in Korea, and his wheelchair pushed by Lance Sergeant Johnson Bahari, also a VC. Bill Speakman is holding the reef. Eighty-nine years old, Bill Speakman. Now, combat stress. We heard from Paul Smith earlier. He's not actually marching, but he is a member of the combat stress because there is a much greater openness now, and thank goodness for it, about mental health issues, which used to be covered up, swept under the carpet, and all the people marching with combat stress have been treated for mental health conditions. The oldest a veteran of Cyprus and Aden, the youngest a veteran of Afghanistan. British X Services Wheelchair Sports Association there. You see how you may get the feeling that people are passing twice. It's because one of our cameras is at the top end of Whitehall and catches them as they come down towards the Cenotaph and the other picks them up as they pass the Cenotaph. But we saw there the British X Services Sports Association and Blesma, the Limnus X Servicemen's Association. The distinct red berry, actually a maroon berry, of the Parachute Regiment, led by Major General Farrah Hockley, who fought at the Battle of Goose Green and the Battle for Port Stanley in the Falklands. A long, long tradition of courage. The 1945, the 6th Division, carried out that airborne crossing of the Rhine, which led towards victory in Europe in 1945. The Black Watch Association, five battalions. There is Joe Hubble, Sergeant Major, being pushed in his wheelchair by his son, Neil. The Black Watch Association, five battalions, fought at the Battle of Passchendaele, which we were seeing before. The wreath laid by Corporal Barty, who, after he left the Black Watch, became Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's driver, until she died. They're followed by the Gordon Highlanders London Association, the Queen's Own Highlanders Regimental Association, and the Royal Scots Regimental Association in the wearing Glengarry's. The Light Infantry Association. This is the first time they've marched past the Cenotaph in their olive green blazers, the Light Infantry cat badge, amalgamated like so many of the infantry regiment regiments to form the Rifles in 2007. Those on parade today coming from all over Britain, Shropshire from the northeast, and many from the West Country.
the Guards Parachute Association there. These soldiers, highly trained special forces pathfinder groups who developed what sounds like a terrifying high altitude free falling technique to get behind enemy lines. The Guards Parachute Company was formed later in 1946 from members of the Brigade of Guards. The Green Howards, there, khaki berries follow there. Green Howards Association, ties and khaki berries, now known as the 2nd Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, they won four. Victoria Crosses during the Battle of the Somme. Not in uniform, but wearing green and white ties. And some of them won there in the khaki berry of the Green Howards. The Cheshire Regiment Association, this is 25th anniversary of a more recent deployment of the Cheshires. First Battalion served in Bosnia. They also have merged, like many other regiments, as the army shrinks in size, to become part of the new Mercian Regiment. The Durham Light Infantry Association. 16 battalions fought in the Battle of the Somme in the First World War. Two and a half thousand people fell in action there. Fusiliers Association from Lancashire in their distinctive red and white hackles on their caps, the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, which have served in every conflict that the UK has participated in in recent years. They're marking the 50th anniversary today. The Cameronians here, the Scottish Rifles, Ian Bilbo, who's 81 years old. Association formed 10 years ago. They went to the 100th anniversary commemoration of the Battle of Passchendaele. As you can imagine, there are such a host of memories here. So many regiments remembering battles, so many people remembering those who've fallen, and some of them family members proudly carrying the medals of their relatives, either fathers, grandfathers, one in wars before. The Reconnaissance Corps, there, following the Women's Royal Army Corps Association, celebrating a hundred years of women in conflict, which we were hearing about with Sophie. By the end of the Second World War, there were more than a quarter of a million women serving in the ATS. The Reconnaissance Corps followed them. The Army Air Corps Veteran Association saw service in Aden in the Cold War. The Army Air Corps, which looks after its own fleet of aircraft, carries out sort of observation and liaison reconnaissance work. Claire Green is marching there, the widow of Corporal Addis, who died in operations in Bosnia in 1999.
Heather Wood, the widow of Charlie Wood, who talked to us so movingly earlier this morning with the Royal Pioneer Corps Association. Charlie Wood, who was killed in Afghanistan. The Pioneers became, in 1993, the Royal Logistics Corps, but they are crucial to any operation. In D-Day, for instance, there were 7,000 pioneers laying fuel, guarding prisoners, moving stores, doing all that kind of work under fire that has to be done to keep the battle going. Scarlet, and genuinely scarlet, bright red berries that mark out the Royal Military Police. Women in war, incidentally, in 1919, for the first time, joined the Royal Military Police Association and used to patrol ports and key sites. For instance, they had a Dover patrol kept an eye on Dover and Folkestone and the ships there. And on horse guards, standing side by side, the Earl of Wessex, and the new Secretary of State for Defence. So everybody who parades past the Cenotaph continues on parade until they've come onto Holst Guards and across and the salute has been taken by the Earl of Wessex. So as the bands go on playing and the contingents go on marching, let's just for a moment Rejoin Sophie Rayworth down there in Whitehall. I'm with a gentleman who is about to take his place in uh, Nine Squadron Association for the March Pass. This is Harry Irons, 94 years old now. You were 17 years old when you flew Lancaster bombers over Germany in World War II. It must have been a terrifying experience. It, what it was, it was terrifying. The, fir the first uh, raid was in Dusseldorf. And actually speaking, I turned the turret round and I had the fright of my life. The, the actual gunfire was absolutely horrendous. And we had to fly through it. And uh, on the first trip, the skipper said, make sure there's nobody above you with a bomb bay open, which happened. And I said to the skipper, there's a lank above us with his bomb bay open. So I started dive port which we did do, and uh, we straightened out, and the bomb aimer said, Skipper, at those times we didn't have a H2S or radar, it was all visual. And the skipper said to me, uh, he's, the skipper said to the uh, pilot, oh, I beg your pardon, the bomb aimer said to the skipper, I've lost the aiming point, we'll have to go round again. And Harry, the extraordinary thing was, when you were you were a rear gunner in a Lancaster, I mean, that was one of the most dangerous jobs at that time. You had a life expectancy of about four sorties. You survived 60 sorties, didn't you? Uh, I did, did achieve 60 sorties. I come back every time, which was very, very unusual. And you come here, you've been here many times. You're about to take your place in the march past. Who who do you remember as you go past the Cenotaph? Because you'd lost a lot of friends, didn't you? I lost, uh, especially my own crews, the two crew. The first crew I lost, they went on pathfinding and they all got shot down. And uh, I, had, I went for a rest and came back on, uh, on the Halifaxes and the rear gunner. And uh, it was the same thing. Uh, their losses were horrendous. I mean, when I say horrendous, it was, they were terrible. It was such a long time ago now, but how vividly do you remember what you saw, what you saw from the back of the Lancaster? I forget it. 
The gunfire was absolutely horrendous. Hundreds of guns firing at you as you went in. And uh, on the way, actually, uh, we, we, uh, we used to call uh, uh, the Ruhr Valley Happy Valley because they gave us a very good reception going in and a better reception going out. And the gunfire, gunfire was absolutely horrendous. But the deadliest thing of all was a night fighter. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Harry, I know you have to take your place now in the march past, but thank you so much for talking to us okay, this morning. Right. Thank you. So one column ends, a band between them, and the blind veterans, formerly St Dunstan's, are passing the cenotaph now. There are over 200 middle there you'll recognize somebody who spoke to us last year, Simon Ward, who lost both eyes in Afghanistan. And we heard from Rob Long talking about the last sunrise that he'd ever see. The Royal Air Force Association which uh, is one of those associations, like many that are here, who visit people who've been bereaved, visit people who need help, actually go and read bedtime stories to children whose parents are away on operations. And they're followed by the RAF Regiment Association. RAF Regiment Association who provide close defense for airfields. The RAF Ex Prisoners of War Association. The Ex Prisoners of War Association for the Royal Air Force. John Nicholl is always here on parade, who was shot down in his tornado the first Gulf War when. Saddam Hussein took Kuwait and on the very first day of that war shot down and taken prisoner released several months later there's also Air Commodore Charles Clark who's the chairman of the Ex-Prisoner War Association who was a Lancaster bomber aimer shot down in 1944 captured went to Stalag Lift 3 7 Squadron Association of Bomber Command. Today operating Chinook helicopters, but remembering those over a thousand of 7 Squadron killed in the Second World War. As we heard from Sophie a moment ago, some points in the war, the rate of survival was only four sorties. The RAF 8 Squadron, the Habanair Association is here, the Royal Air Force Mountain Rescue Association, all these members of the Royal Air Force and the Women's Royal Air Force formed in the summer of 1939, the Auxiliary Air Force, and women at that stage were put in charge of repairing and maintaining aircraft and vehicles. Women having first been recruited into the Royal Air Force in 
1918. Sea rescue and marine craft there wearing white roll neck sweaters under their club blazers. Standard during the war while at sea they ran high speed launches, fixed wing aircraft to rescue pilots who had crashed into the channel. The Royal Air Force Police Association and their white service caps known as the snowdrops. there who won the Distinguished Service Medal from the Royal Air Force Survival Equipment Squippers Association. Wearing spectacles there on the bottom of the left of the screen, coming into the middle now with his medals, on his left chest, you'll recognize him, Keith Bolter, who talked about why he was marching past. So the Royal Air Force, the Bomber Command, the Bomber Squadrons, the Parachute Jumping Instructors all go past. And now the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry we're into another column, column D of the procession. The fannies who still operate in civilian life, working in, well, in recent tragedies at Westminster and the Manchester bombing, London Bridge and Grenfell Tower, they're there, still doing their work, formed way back in 1907. Thirty-five years since the Falklands War and the South Atlantic Medal Association is parading here. South Atlantic Medical Medal, Medal Association then goes past. And there are many, many more contingents still to come. But at this point, let's just briefly rejoin Sophie Rayworth on Horse Guards. Yes, well, I'm here with a man who has been here very many times, Ken Fraser, who served with the King's Own Scottish Borderers. It means a lot to you, doesn't it, to come here year after year. Why? Explain why. Well, it's remembering that all those that didn't come back, you know, and remembrance, and, and just thinking about, you know. But it's something that you are determined to do, oh, isn't yes, it? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. And I, I love coming down here. You know, it, it's a great get-together. Uh, we all meet up once a year, and it's, it's fabulous. It's a fabulous weekend, and this is the 
accommodates it all, you know, the remembrance part of it. You joined the army just at the end of World War II. Yes. You served all over the world, didn't you? Yes. You fought in Korea. Yes. Yes. In the uh, Korean War. In the Korean War, yes. Uh, that was quite uh, an experience. Uh, the the North Koreans invaded, you know, South Korea. Uh, that was in June 1950. Uh, and it, they were pushed right the way back to the 38th parallel. And uh, the big battles commenced. And towards the end of 51, the, there was no... We went up to the, the 38th parallel, but there was nobody giving in. And it kind of reverted to trench warfare where we were faced with the enemy 1,000 yards ahead of us. And the only place you can operate was during the day, uh, during night time. During the day, you had to keep your head down. But the Chinese on the other side, they'd come through their hills where we had to go over their hill. You know, so it was the Chinese that we were actually fighting there, not the North Koreans. You, you stayed in the army for a long time. You served for nearly 40 years, but I, you, you retired 25 years ago. I say you retired. Yeah, I mean, the army is your life. You, you really haven't retired, have you? No, I haven't. No, I'm going to the barracks every day and uh, as a volunteer and to do odd jobs that go and going, mounting medals, cleaning uh, uniforms, anything at all. It's just it's, it's my life. And I hope to be doing it for many more years, although I'm 90 next month. So. There's a wonderful camaraderie here, isn't there, today? It's marvellous. It is really marvellous. Uh, and I want to continue doing it. Yeah. Well, let's hope you do. Lovely to meet you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much indeed. The Merchant Navy Association, we were talking to Vivian Foster, the national president, and um, carrying that white anchor. Well, they say the Merchant Navy was forgotten, like people who fought in Burma say they were the forgotten army, but in reality, I think we now know that they played an absolutely crucial role in supplying Britain in two world wars. They're followed by the naval contingents, including the Corvette Association, the flower class, one of the smallest warships, which uh, went with the convoys. It's 100 years since the first convoy, and uh, rolled in the seas in the most amazing, ferocious way that people who served in Corvette swore by them, the flower class named after almost inappropriate for going to war with a ship called Bluebell or Nasturtium, but there were many of them. And among the other ships represented here, the Argonaut, Exeter Association, Ganges, the Glasgow, Hermes Association, HMS Hermes, first ship ever designed as an aircraft carrier was the Hermes in sunk in Ceylon in 1942 and there was an, another Hermes carrier of course at the Falklands War several of the veterans of Hermes actually went back to India for the decommissioning of the ship she had been sold to the Indian government the Tongue class is here also ships named after villages ending with the words T-O-N, like the one that Prince Charles commanded, Bronnington, back in 1976. The illustrious association is here, the HMS Penelope Association, the ship torpedoed by German U-boats. Type 42 frigates, Glasgow and Sheffield and Coventry, who all served in the Falklands are here. The Submariners, a 92-year-old World War II veteran in a wheelchair being pushed by his son, who's come from Australia.
Association of Royal Yachtsmen. Interestingly, during the Aden crisis in the mid-60s, the Royal Yacht Britannia was the only ship allowed to enter the harbour in Aden to evacuate British citizens. The Royal Naval Benevolent Trust, led by its chief executive who served 32 years, served in the Gulf. It's established to help people serving or who have served as ratings in the Royal Navy or in the Royal Marines and their families. One of many charities should mention the Royal British Legion and Help for Heroes are only two of many, many charities, some of whom are represented here, who help in one way or another different aspects of these services. And now the what is called the Fly Navy Federation, a, a whole number of organizations marching under the umbrella of Fly Navy, set up in 2009 to celebrate 100 years of naval aviation. And they say, which is interesting, that the, the Navy has been flying for more years than the Air Force to celebrate their centenary in 2018. Among them, the Fleet Air Arm Armourers, Fleet Air Arm Association, the Buccaneer Association, the Field Gun Association, Fleet Air Arm Jungle Association, and at the very back of this section, one man marching alone. He used to march with his wife, but she's marching this year in another contingent from the Cloud Observers Association, Arthur Charles. The Cloud Observers were men and women of all ranks who served in the meteorological branch of the Royal Navy. Now we move to the last column, led by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, Transport for London. Well remembered because London buses carried the troops to the front in the First World War. And leading the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, or among them, Jill Howes, whose grandfather was actually a stonemason who worked on the cenotaph when it was built. The War Graves Commission look after graves in 154 countries across the world, and they will identify graves. If you have a relative who's missing, they will try and find the grave where they're buried. They have an organization devoted to doing that. The children of the Far East prisoners of war follow transport for London, 60 of them. And so they go on round horse guards. We start having not military, but other members of services, people devoted to ambulance work, to the Red Cross, and marching here. But let's for a moment rejoin Sophie Rayworth on Horse Guards. Yes, I'm here with three people who've just taken part in the march past the last two surviving veterans who fought in the Battle of Monte Cassino in Italy. It was between January and May 1944, one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. And there were supposed to be three veterans marching here today. Um, but Rosemary Hayward, your father, Jim, John Hodgson, died very, very recently, didn't just, just weeks ago. Yes, he died in September. He planned to be here today, so it's an immense pride that I stand here with, uh, with his medals on and having been part of the parade in his memory but also in the memory of so many veterans, surviving ones and also uh, more recent com conflicts, to be part of this has been immense 
privilege and I am very proud to be part of it. I remember speaking to him a few years ago. He led the contingent last year. He was determined, wasn't he, to come here year after year. It must have been incredibly emotional for you walking past the Senator. Very much so. And to be a member of the Monte Cassino Society, to, to meet veterans and family and friends has been immensely important both to him and to carry on his memory today especially. Jim Knox, you were you fought at the Battle of Monte Cassino. You were so young when you did. It was it was a horrific battle, wasn't it? So it was bloody. indeed, yes. Uh, we arrived in the gust of line with the second New Zealand div for four months and we ended up in Monte Cassino on the 29th of April. Uh, it was rather alarming as we approached it the sky was lighting up but it was Vesuvius was erupting so that was a relief anyway we we got into Monte Cassino station and we was there for just on two weeks then we withdrew from there to San Angio where we had a, a shower and was deloused and what have you it was the losses in just four months. I think it was more than 55,000 Allied forces died or were wounded, lost their lives That's what's in, in just four months. Yeah. Who do you remember? Who were you thinking about when you passed the senator? Uh, I was thinking about how lucky I was to get out, first of all. <laughs> and then you think of some of the friends that you had that you'll never see again. Quite worrying Let me time. just very quickly, Ronald Evans as well. You're 96 years old and you're here for your first time. What was that like? It's very cold very, today. Very, very cold, but very, very, cold. Th very thoughtful. You're immediately thinking about all your pals that were with you at the casino and uh, all the counting. Well, for, amazing, yes. amazing that you are here today. for the Germans. Well, amazing to see you here today. Thank you so much for, for talking to us. Thank you all. Well, it certainly is an arduous march and very cold for some of the older veterans who are marching here. So, we have younger members now. The Scout Association has been here, the Army Cadets, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the Girl Guides, the Boys Brigade. Here are the Kent Police marching for the first time. St. John Ambulance Cadets marching for the first time. Wrongly called St. John's Ambulance, they always complain. They are St. John Ambulance. And they, of course, work at public events and at emergency events all over the UK. The Firefighters Memorial Trust is there, the Metropolitan Police Service, the Post Office Fellowship of Remembrance, the Church Lads and Church Girls Brigade. Post Office Fellowship of Remembrance hidden in, uh, in the Metropolitan Police Service and the West Midlands. This is at the back end of the column. You saw the Scouts Association and the Girl Guides going through and the Boys Brigade. And a time of war and in the Second World War in particular, the guides and the scouts played a very important part after bombing raids, providing help and assistance, and reserved their place here. Well, now, that is the very end of the final column going past. They're coming out here onto horse guards.
And uh, Sophie is on horse guards where all these veterans have been arriving after they've passed the cenotaph. Yes, more than uh, almost 9,000 veterans and civilians all returning here now to Horse Guards Parade. I've got two of them here who have uh, just marched past the Cenotaph from the Royal Pioneer Corps, and that's uh, Drum Major Desmond Bryant and Glenn Lath. And uh, what kind of day did you have? Well, it must You come here year after year, yeah, don't you? It's, it's very uplifting day. And the camaraderie is wonderful, isn't it? Between you really feel it when you're standing out there on Whitehall and the way the mood shifts through the morning. Oh, well, most certainly. You, know, you can't beat it. You can't replace it either. What yeah. is it that brings you back year after year, though? Why are you so determined to come? I come to pay respects to those who have given their life for me. Because as a veteran, a veteran is a person that signs a blank check for the country and, and we're willing to pay that check up to including his life. And that is why I go here every day, every year. And who is it that you think about when you march past the Senator year after year? Obviously, all the colleagues that we've lost over the conflicts and the wars uh, before, my granddad and my father, who both served in both wars. And uh, the camaraderie is unbelievable. You can't get it anywhere else in this world. There is um, a real bond, isn't there? We are one big family. We're all brothers and sisters in the same, group, the same house, you know? And it's actually excellent. And I love it every year. Well, lovely of you both to talk to us. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nearly 9,000 people then have marched down horse guards and now the final contingents are coming out for the march past with the parade being uh, taking the salute, the Earl of Wessex and the new Secretary of State for Defence. And I think it should also be said, perhaps, that this isn't the end of the event for many of these people because these groups who come here to London, they come down from Scotland, from, come up from Wales, West Country, and actually they, once they've been through this formality, they probably had a meeting earlier on in the week, and then they go away and celebrate. The pubs round here are crammed full after this is done, people reminiscing. So the formality and the, the memory is one side, and the sheer friendship and bonds of friendship are strong. Sophie's got two more people with her who've been marching. Let's hear from her. I do indeed. I'm talking to here Joan Deval and to Neil Trotter, who is the National Service RAF Association. And Joan, you had an extraordinary job. Tell me what you did in, in World War II. I was what is known as a height finder and predictor operator on anti-aircraft battery. And what was your what did that involve? What did well you... that that's getting the height as the planes come in and you shout the net whatever it is, so many. Uh, over to the men on the guns, the guns elevate, and then we go to wait, go to fire then. What, you've come here many times, haven't you? Yes, yes. What was today like for you? Wonderful, every day is wonderful. It, it's, it gets the, uh, as soon as you get in here, everybody seems to drop a few years younger and they're old, do you remember when? And it's wonderful camaraderie. And Neil Trotter, very quickly, I must ask you as well, what did it mean to you today as you passed the Senator? Well, it's uh, a day of reflection and remembrance. And I had an awful lot of uh, members in the war, uh, First World War and Second. Luckily, we didn't lose anyone, but uh, I still remember the hardships they went through and the families as well. Very important to be here. Thank you both very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in a moment, we must leave Whitehall after this annual ceremony of remembrance, the laying of wreaths, the long columns of the march past, a seven-year-old and a 99-year-old paying their tribute. We've heard of the pride of those who face the fear of war and its horrors and have come through. We've been reminded of the pain of war the suffering of the injured, the loneliness of those who've lost family or friends or lovers. 
And we have perhaps given an answer to that poet who wrote of the dark months of the First World War. Have you forgotten yet? Look up and swear by the green of the spring. You'll never forget.